Everybody, welcome to another episode of NASA and Silicon Valley Live. I am your host, Tiffany Blake. If this is your first time tuning into the show, NASA and Silicon Valley Live is a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center where we talk about all of the nerdy NASA news you need to know. Today I have with me the always awesome Abby. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> yes, I am your co-host today. I'm Abby Tabor. Thanks for joining us. And we are simultaneously live right now on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. But if you want to join in the chat and ask our guests questions during the show, you need to do that on Twitch. So go to www.twitch.tv slash NASA. So today we are taking a trip down memory lane and talking about the upcoming anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. Yes, I am super, super excited, excited about this. So yes. July 20th will mark the 50th anniversary of humans taking their first steps on the moon on another world actually, if you think about it. So <laughs> joining us today to talk about this historic achievement are our guests, Kimberly and Chad. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourselves and tell the audience a little about, your, about, about yourself? Well, Abby and Tiffany, thank you for having <laughs> us. Um, I'm Kimberly Annico smith I'm a research astrophysicist at NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. And as a NASA scientist, I'm solving problems, and I work a lot with instruments and mission design for new missions in space. So cool. Thanks. And hi, I'm Chad Frost. I'm the Deputy Director for Engineering here at NASA Ames Research Center. And our, our folks uh, have the most excellent role of basically um, making the ideas and concepts and missions that folks like Kimberly uh, come up with come to life. Uh, wow. they, they have these wonderful ideas for science and missions, and we get to build them. How awesome. That is That's so cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, like awesome jobs, right? Um, before we get into talking about the Apollo anniversary, uh, which is just two days away, um, I want to remind our audience that we're also counting down to another important milestone in human space exploration. Right. That's what the clock is all about. <laughs> so five years from now, NASA is planning to send humans to the moon as part of our Artemis program, which we're going to talk a little more about later on. And this clock here is counting down the days, hours, minutes and seconds until 2024 when the first woman and who knows the next man will walk on the moon's south pole somewhere humans have never been before. So we're pretty excited about that. We're going to talk about that later also in the show. So for now, let's get back to Apollo. Yes, Apollo. So the moon landing, kind of a big deal. What do you guys think? <laughs> well, it's really exciting to look back on it, right, with the, the perspective of 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was an amazing achievement then, and, and it hasn't really been duplicated. Yeah. Right? Uh, we're coming back to it in Artemis to finally send humans back to the moon, but it's easy to forget what a huge undertaking it was uh, back 50 years ago. Yeah. And so to go back and, and sort of do a retrospective uh, and remember all of that is just amazing. It's a great opportunity. I mean, I was not even a twinkle in my parents' eye, so <laughs> Apollo, I, I'm after Apollo. But looking back at learning about what it took to put mm. humans on the moon, um, so July 20th, 1969, the first humans landing on the moon. It's the culmination of a lot of work, an incredible engineering mm, promise. Yeah. And um, it, it, there was a charge by the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. He addressed Congress, and I looked this up, May 25th, 1961. Mm -hmm. That was 20 days after Alan Shepard did the first suborbital human flight. Okay. Ah. And he charged the nation to put a man on the moon wow. and return him safely to Earth within the decade. So, like, it's pretty audacious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Less than three weeks later. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Let's go for the moon. Let's, let's how, about, the moon. how about the moon? And let's then, go big. Go and big. You, had, you had this Mercury program that had all these firsts, and then the Gemini, which had two astronauts. And there was a period 
in the mid-60s, 65, 66, where we had 10 human missions in space in a period of 12 months. Wow. And what they were doing was working out all the different legs of doing the Apollo uh-huh. mission. Little by little. To put um, humans on the moon. What a time. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, unlike Kimberly, I actually remember the first moon landing, and I was, I was a little kid, but I remember distinctly having my little space helmet on Aww. and sitting in front of our little Static and black and white <laughs> television, watching the first moon landing, and I mean Amazing. it was one of those really formative experiences. Is probably why I'm here as a NASA engineer today. Incredible. But but to think back on it, and and it was such a a, a hugely impactful event, mm-hmm. really for all of humanity. Yeah. Certainly yeah. for those Absolutely. of us here in the U.S., but it was a global event that yeah. everybody that could see it or watch it right. did. And it was in all the papers around the globe because it was yeah. such a big deal. But it took a lot of work to get oh, to that yeah. point. Absolutely. Kimberly yeah. mentioned this whole succession of launches and missions mm-hmm. to, you know, to chip away at the really hard engineering and technical problems, uh, which were many, 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 to ultimately get to the point where mm-hmm. we could launch a rocket big enough to carry humans to the moon, um, around the moon, down to the surface of the moon, and all the way back. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a, a nearly insurmountable set right. of engineering problems yeah. that enormous resources from the country were put towards yeah. to make happen. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. I so to... let's get into the basics. So who were the astronauts that actually got this this great opportunity this to land on the moon for the so first we're time? We're talking about Apollo 11. Yes. So this is a series of Apollo missions, but Apollo 11 is the first time we had humans on the moon. Yes. And there are three um, astronauts um, per Apollo mission, and the ones that w- were on that mission, which was not predetermined, it was all part of, you know, the rota that they were in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Neil Armstrong and uh, Edwin Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins were the three gentlemen who did this historic first landing on the moon. And mm-hmm. Michael Collins is the one who was in the um, command module in orbit around the moon. Yeah, ah. yeah okay. He, so stayed he orbiting, had a different yeah. perspective. But of that course, was the design yeah. of the Apollo program. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So right. where did they land when they reached the moon? Well, they were they were almost on the equator, right? Okay. So right. Uh, we had we had a little model in here the other day, and we're like looking at the little moon model, going, "Well, where was it?" And it's, oh yeah, it's right on the equator. It's actually pretty easy to spot, <laughs> right? It was on right on the edge of the the sea, sea of, of tranquility. tranquility. Yeah, so it's one of these Lovely. dark areas. But if you look at the um, we call the face in the moon, it's one mm-hmm. of the eyes. Oh, it is. Ah, <laughs> <I knew laughs> the nose. <laughs> Fun fact. So, yeah. And what was interesting on the actual um, moon landing. Uh, July 20th, 1969, uh, the moon was a waxing crescent. And um, when the landing occurred, it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. Mm-hmm. But when it was time to open up the lunar module and take the first steps on the moon, it was around 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern mm-hmm. time. The sun had set around 8. Wow. So it was nighttime if you were on the east side of the, of the U.S. Mm-hmm. And you could look up and go, there are so two people yeah. on the moon right now. <laughs> oh my God! Isn't that amazing. <laughs> That's and we, were, we had some anecdotes. We were talking the other day that people went out and looked to see if they could see them. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, they're a little too small to see with even of a big telescope. Yeah. But but people did that, right? They were so excited to go and see. Oh, there's people up there right now. Right. Maybe, maybe I can go out and look up and see them. You'd have and to try. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> that's so cool. We have a comment I want to share from Tyrannical Zombie. I legit didn't know we were planning to go back to the moon. This is absolutely awesome, and I'm so excited. Well, yeah. we're going to talk about <laughs> so we? we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then to get to the moon, we needed a. Uh, uh, the most powerful rocket yeah. that had never been. I mean, up to now, mm-hmm. putting humans or even other spacecraft in was around or around orbit around the Earth. Mm-hmm. In order right. to actually escape the Earth's gravity and then have enough fuel to go to the Moon, which is a quarter of a million miles yeah. away, a three-day trip. Wow! Yeah. And, and then do all that back. maneuvers and come back. Yeah, that was a big rocket. Right. Yeah. And that, of course, was the Saturn V, right? When Saturn V. We're, we're, right. people, people hear about the Saturn V and they forget just what a, a huge rocket that was, right? The Saturn V, um, you know, is, is, let's see, it was uh, almost 400 feet tall, 363 feet oh, wow. tall. Wow. Right? What does that compare to? Well, it's um, taller than the Statue of Liberty. For real. Right? Ah. Yeah. I wow. think we have a graphic ah, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Compared. This is actually a graphic from back in the day, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
So it's huge. Nearly like yeah. 7 million pounds of thrust. And uh, Chad, you had you were telling about how you'd seen a Falcon 9 launch and what, you could feel it. Yeah, so I was fortunate enough to be out at um, Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral uh, a few months ago for uh, a Falcon Heavy uh, launch. A Falcon and Heavy. This is a pretty big, pretty big rocket. And... You know, you, you see these on TV, and you're like, okay, there's a lot of lot of smoke and light, and up it goes, um, and that that's true. <laughs> but what doesn't come across on TV is that you you feel it, you just viscerally <laughs> feel it, feel yeah. it feel in it your body, body. Yeah. because Heart, all that ground, power right? at launch is is coming out, and it's rolling towards you. Wow. So there's yeah, yeah, there's fire and smoke and thunder, and yeah, you you feel yeah. launch. And the Falcon Heavy is a lot smaller than, than one Saturn. of these big things. That's crazy. Yeah. Big things. Right. So. Is the Saturn V still the most powerful rocket that's ever flown till now? It is today. It, it, it is. is today. Yes. Yes. And 33, of three, 33 of them were flown oh, wow. throughout wow. the test program. Wow. wow. Yeah. Huh. yeah. That's impressive. And then um, what was in the Saturn V rocket are these amazing spaceships. I mean, these Apollo engineers were creative, mm -hmm. elegant, and precise. Right. Which and I think you would have to have to be in or in order to you know to such an ambitious yeah to pull this you know, off mission. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. we had we had these two amazing spacecraft we had um i just get to see you we had the what we would call the sort of the command module the orion <laughs> sorry oh, yeah. <laughs> she's forward there excited she's about too orion. excited <laughs> Apollo capsule and a command module that had all the, the, the fuel and the like. Um, and then it was uh, staged on top of the lunar excursion module during launch. And then it launch happened. This had moved off and then it had pirouetted around and attached itself. Oh. And we had this combination of two different, or one could say three to four different spacecraft together going Traveling. to the moon. Mm -hmm. the moon. Wow. That's and impressive. then we have the three astronauts are in the... Um, Apollo, yeah, the command module. The command mm -hmm. module was called Columbia, mm -hmm. and then it was time for the lunar landing on July twentieth. Aldrin and Armstrong would move into the lunar excursion module, and they would come apart. Uh -huh. Michael Collins will go in orbit around the moon, mm -hmm. and I'm left with the lunar module, which Neil Armstrong then piloted to then land. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> on the moon. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, the two amazing. astronauts are on the moon. Michael Collins is around uh, orbiting, orbiting. The, the, orbiting the moon orbiting. at the, lo the loneliest job in the world. Right. It's still extraordinary to be on the far of side. Course. Anyway, another story <laughs> no, about not that. Not too bad, yeah. Um, yeah and the then the, uh, <laughs> the two astronauts would um, uh, egress and then set foot yes. on, on the moon. moon. Wow. So tell them about the debate over the first words spoken from the moon yeah. that you told me about. Well, um, so we all know, or we may, if you're a history, if you read about, you know, Houston, you know, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed, because right. the lunar excursion model, it was called Eagle. So we had Columbia in orbit, and then Eagle has yeah, landed. The Eagle has landed, we've all heard that. <laughs> right? As, yeah, as yeah, this, yeah. this vehicle's being piloted by Armstrong, and it was about to land, there are these two poles, There's the, three of the four legs had these um, poles about five feet long. And um, when they touch the surface of the moon, uh, Buzz Aldrin calls out, contact light. Contact wow. light. Followed by shutdown. Followed by OK, engine stop. Followed by out of detent. All these, and you can hear this. Wow. They're yeah. going through a checklist. And then somehow between contact light and 20 seconds later, we had landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. And then Aldrin comes on and says, Houston, tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Yeah. So, doesn't, like, doesn't it feel like a, like a, just, you know. <laughs> So it's, it's possibly it's like you're there. It could have been <laughs> engine stop. Could have been, been. actually. <laughs> it depends what you consider. It depends on your definition. Right. Oh, it right. just depends right. on your definition. Yeah. What was that? And in contact light is when they actually did have the. And it, actually, if you're an eagle eyes, you can look mm -hmm. at the pictures of the Apollo of the eagle, and you can look to see that the um, the posts have actually bent ninety degrees and sticking out. Oh yeah. Wow. Because they did not sink into the surface ah, where they landed. I see. Yeah. At the it's time, no, no one had any idea how how soft and fluffy or and deep the dust on the lunar surface might be okay. they didn't know you know as we land the spacecraft is it is it going to sink three feet into the surface or mm. is it going to be you know hard as a rock or somewhere in between yeah. we just didn't know no yeah. and so they had these, these probes on yeah. the landing gear to yeah. try and see they were just the, i mean the lem is my 
my favorite spaceship because it was the first spaceship designed to exist in a vacuum. Mm. I mean, it only oh, yeah. has the thinnest walls, you know, as thin as a, is, is, is like aluminum foil. Mm. I mean, Buzz Aldrin has a story that you can you could put a pen through it. Wow. And, could have, and that was protecting the astronauts from wow. the emptiness of space. Wow. Oh, wow. But that was all because of weight. Yeah. Wow, of course. And you so, need to minimize So now weight, we're, right? we're yeah. at the period where the astronauts are on the surface. They're, uh, for Apollo 11, they were only there for 21 and a half hours. But in terms of walking around, mm-hmm. only two and a half hours. They only actually yeah. spent two and a half yeah. hours <laughs> out, outside the vehicle on the surface. And they, wa- yeah. and they walked to about hours. 300 feet away from the Eagle. Okay. Um, Took lots of pictures. Yeah. Did some experiments. Yeah. What kinds of experiments? Yeah. What were those? Well, um, well, one of the ones was to put um, a seismometer. They were interested in moonquakes. Moonquakes. Moon <laughs> so here in California, <laughs> we have earthquakes. I think that's so, cool. <laughs> so moonquakes, because at the time in the sixties, we didn't really know what the moon surface interior or anything was like, and so they did register moonquakes. That's they also amazing. had an yeah. instrument to measure dust. Right. Um, they were interested in, they had a flag that they put out just to see what um, the what was in the atmosphere. And one of the neatest instruments... That's my, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 well, they deployed a laser retro reflector. So mm-hmm. it was a, a corner reflector that has this great property of if you shine a laser at it, um, it reflects the laser straight back from where it came. And so they deployed this on the surface of the moon and they could shine lasers from Earth at the moon, wow. and the laser would be reflected straight back, and they could measure how long it took the laser uh, to go to the moon and back, and get a very, very precise uh, range measurement. And it's it's uh, a really cool instrument. They've deployed others on the surface of the moon, and they are still being used today. Yeah, that's impressive. That's right. And, and we've learned that the usual, and yeah. we've learned that the moon is receding from us about one and a half inches a year. Yeah, it's going so if you, away. If you stick and around long enough. <laughs> And it even uh, confirmed Einstein's theory of general relativity by a wow. refined knowledge of the moon's orbit around the Earth. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Ah. So impressive. it's a really impressive. So yeah, now we've had so. our astronauts to deploy, and they took pictures and videos. They planted a flag. They had a, pre- they had a, a phone conversation with President mm-hmm. Nixon. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, Neil Armstrong's first words on the moon, uh, small step for a man. Giant leap for mankind. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. come in peace for all of, or you know, all of humankind was on the plaque. Yeah, yeah I think we have an, an image actually of. Um, there we, yeah, there we go. Image. Who is this? I think that's Buzz, Buzz Aldrin, Aldrin. Right? Yeah. and uh, it's uh, Neil Armstrong taking that picture. And you can kind of see the reflection of him taking yeah. it. Yeah, the reflection. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing they did is they also collected soil samples and rock samples. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that Ar- Armstrong did right as he got out of the LEM was he took a contingency sample in case they needed to get back to Earth right away. Oh, yeah. He had something, and he put it up, and he put it in his right, p- right side pocket, mm. and he had a soil sample. But during the course of two and a half um, hours, they were able to collect rocks and soils, which has transformed um, lunar science. And, and quite a bit, right? Yeah, they picked up quite a bit of about material. 40 pounds or so. On that trip. Yeah, 40, 45 and pounds. And over the course of all the Apollo missions, we ended up with, what? About 800, yeah. 840 pounds over six landed so, missions. So quite a wow. bit. Yeah. yeah. And cool. they've just been instrumental. So mm-hmm. after they had um, gone into the, I'll go back to my model, we've had our moon walks and we've collected our science. The great thing about the engineers is now we have the LEM is going to depart with the ascent stage, which is also an engineering achievement, had to work on its first time. Uh-huh. And now it's going to rendezvous with Mike Collins, and he's now going to have his buddy. And reunited. W- reunited. <laughs> the three gentlemen are so back good. in space. <laughs> hey, Mike. And then it's time to come home. And so this gets jettisoned. Mm-hmm. And then we wind up having, oops, the Apollo capsule. Ah. It's falling apart. This gets jettisoned. And that's what comes home. And that's how they return home. And that's yeah, how they return right. home. That's amazing. We're going to talk more about that later. I wanted yeah. to mention you guys answered the question from Pagamador. Sorry if I got that wrong, but um, how long did they stay on the moon during the Apollo missions? This one you said they were on the surface. On the surface for 21 and a half hours, but okay. their actual walking was only two, two and, and a half, half hours. hours. And then what is this about? They had to take a nap before they could leave or, or they had to have a rest period what was that <laughs> I, I think there i think there was some napping i mean they just yeah. spent a really intense period right, of course um, 
you know, not only getting to the moon, um, but bringing the lander down from orbit to land. And that, that was, as you may have seen in some of the you know, movies and other coverage, that was a very exciting ride. They did not land right where they thought they were going to be. Mm -hmm. Overshot Um, by about four miles? Overshot, had to find a a less bouldery area, a place that was suitable to land, and they almost ran out of fuel Fuel. in the process. So it was pretty stressful, pretty intense. intense. Uh, So so I think they needed a little downtime. Um, (laughs) There were also the, the inherent limitations of... Um, you only have so much uh, oxygen, so many supplies. Oh. You know, you're only equipped to be there for this relatively short time. Yeah. Um, well, and and yes. they, they knocked it out for, you know, it's the very first time anyone had done it. So they were being very conservative in all regards. Right. Understandable. They weren't pushing yeah. And the learning boundaries. while doing so. Learning yeah. while they were at it. Yeah. Yeah, and that, then that, the, the follow-on Apollo missions would build upon Apollo 11, things that were, I just, you know, you're always building upon what you're learning from each right. of these things, such that the later Apollo missions spent up to three days on the surface oh, doing okay. science experiments mm, right. and had the rover and did all, lots of great things. All right. Well, yeah, yeah. this answers my question, which was, seriously, they had to go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> They're on the moon? Right. And it's like, like and, and it's and time. Lie down Those now. Those <laughs> engineers took out the seats in the Apollo 11 lander. So they were just like sleeping on the floor. Oh, really? The, oh, the later yeah. ones they put a hammock in, but huh. still, in order to save weight, they got rid of the huh. seats. I so they're landing and standing up. It's, it's, oh, inter- cool. it's interesting to fly the, the lunar module. So I've actually got um, some some stick time in our uh, simulator for the lunar module. You flew yes. so I, actually, I, actually got, I actually got to quote, land on the moon with both, both Rusty Schweikert and Charlie Duke, who were both uh, ah. Apollo Ooh. lunar module pilots. No kidding. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're standing up. You're flying the thing. You, you know there is no seat. You're just standing <laughs> up and you know bringing the thing in and flying it. And of course, both those guys are, are you know crack, cracker jack at it because you know they flew the real thing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're both. They were both still very good at it and you know much better than us. But just that experience of what's what's it really like to try and go fly and land on the moon it's it's not like flying an airplane it's not like flying a helicopter it's a completely unique and different experience yeah. mm-hmm. it has to be right it's well, not and, the earth and we're on the verge of having to relearn that all again for yeah. the new program and we're smarter too and like you said we learned so much by right. you know Thanks to Apollo, some of the, right? the the videos of buzz and um and neil jumping around the surface on apollo 11 you'll see them they're trying out different steps because they're trying to figure out how to walk in one six gravity uh-huh with the bulky spaceship right. so you see them hopping the seats, and yeah. all that yeah. so this that was also part of experiments right, as well right. you know when to know how could we work and live in this environment right. it tur- turns out skipping, skipping. The skipping. Oh. <laughs> is that why you see them skipping yeah, yeah, because that's, that's, they look like they're turns out that, that's pretty much the most efficient <laughs> locomotion yeah. on the earth yeah. that's pretty cool yeah, great. <laughs> having to adapt in the moment and learn exactly that's you know answering happening. those questions that we did not know because you can only simulate so much you have to go there yeah and that's where you're going to make the big leaps and knowledge understanding it's like Smooth Master says, moving in those suits is insane. It must be, right? <laughs> yeah, and you got this big and chunky thing. I'm like, look at it off your shoulder and all that. Yeah. And the lunar module is your favorite spacecraft? Is I, that- my favorite spacecraft, Dave. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, then, you, <laughs> then I want you to know that Aperture Combined says, my grandfather helped with the design of the lunar module. <gasps> oh, my gosh. That's awesome. awesome. Lucky. That is awesome. The thing I like, the, the reason the lunar module is my favorite is because, um, you know, it's it's – one of the few vehicles that we've ever built that is really designed only for the space environment. environment. Right? Yeah. It yeah. never has to go through an atmosphere. Oh right, yeah. okay. right. And so it doesn't yeah. it doesn't look like a, an atmospheric right. vehicle. Yeah. And you know, the International Space Station is another example. But there's not yeah. very many that are like that. Almost everything else, either you know, it's yeah. got to go up through an atmosphere, or it's got to come back through an atmosphere. And so it's just a very distinctly different kind yeah. of vehicle. I, I really like them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, for those of you who build spacecraft yeah. or right. design instruments for them, yeah, that matters. Very cool. So one cool thing about celebrating the anniversary is that we've been gathering people's memories. And so I thought about, what's my memory of Apollo yeah. 50th? I wasn't born then. Right. But it made me think, oh my gosh, my dad had this videotape that he sat me and my sister down in front of. He popped it on the VCR. And it was this weird, grainy, black and white footage. I didn't even know what it was. But it was the Apollo 11 moon landing. And at the time, I don't know, I was in elementary school or something. And I didn't get it. But mm-hmm. I knew that this mattered to my dad. He made us sit and watch it. He was and now excited I get it. Yeah. to share it with you. 
It's yeah. so cool. Yeah, it That's cool. probably why you're here at NASA too. Maybe. Maybe. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And, and now, it's, now it's, people it's, are watching on the web. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's easy. Right. It was special. But then. Just, you know, try to think about just being back there and just, you know, it in was the a defining moment in history in that century. Yeah, for that, the world. That yeah. Just for the really? whole world. Yeah. Tuning yeah. in and watching this. I think that's amazing, right? Just in t- like everyone across the entire globe looking up at the moon, just mm-hmm. all at once. That's just amazing, right? Do you have some of those memories to share with us from? I do. So mm-hmm. we have uh, more stories, and they're actually from you all. Uh, we invited people all over the world to share their, share their Apollo 11 man- moon landing stories. And so we collected their responses, and um, they are part of our NASA Explorers Your Apollo Stories podcast. Um, and here's one we have here from um, Ellen in Calistoga, California. We are all glued to our television that day. Mind you, this is a television that only got three channels, so I'm grateful that we were able to watch. It was quite fuzzy, but it was so exciting. And me, being young, I immediately went outside with a pair of binoculars to stare at the moon to see if I could see Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. You know, when you're young... Anything is possible. So nice. That's amazing. So if you all want to hear more stories like Ellen's, you can go to www.nasa.gov slash Apollo stories and browse through those. And now we have a whole bunch of questions waiting for us. I think should we jump to our question section? Yeah. You want to... Do you want to lead us off into rapid fire question rapid time? Rapid fire, really, really quickly. Okay. Okay. So we have here from an Easter egg. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Why the moon before Mars? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. The, the biggest challenge with sending humans to Mars is that you know it's so much further away. It takes a lot longer to get there than going to the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, and that duration introduces lots and lots of, of big problems, right? There's longer exposure to radiation, longer exposure to uh, really no gravity, mm-hmm. um, you know, living in a basically a tin can um, for potentially months, uh, mm-hmm. plus all of the technical um, devices and systems that have to be reliable enough to last that long. And rather than just make a go of it and give it a give it your best shot it's easier to prove all that out a little bit closer to home you know we've got a long period of having humans in earth orbit on the space station Um, the next big step is to go for that much further um, away from us and to spend that much more time that takes us to the moon and the mars is a very different mindset as well right you know communication could be at much 20 mm-hmm. minutes 30 minutes so, so much you're going to be away. very independent mm-hmm. when you're out there on your own yeah. doing space exploration um here's one from stinkfoot 34 how much fuel did it take to lift the lunar module the lem off the moon you guys happen to know well, that? that's a good question i don't I, know i remember seeing the the number for the the Lem crew module, and I want to say, don't quote me on this, but I think more than zero. I think it was about it, it was you know a few let's say a few hundred gallons. Right? It was not a huge, um, uh, not a huge amount, but it only had that one job to do. It had that one mm-hmm. job, and it, had, and, and it had to work that one time. Right? Yeah. yeah. I know the numbers published. I, I just don't have it at the tip of my tongue, but it's there's, it's interesting. All the Apollo technical documents right are out there. You can go online and download all the Apollo reports, all the experience reports, um, and like all those technical details, they're all in there. You can just go look them up. It's really yeah. cool to just browse through it and. You know, Doesn't everyone have the <laughs> Apollo technical manual at home? Right. I do. So. I think that goes without saying. Full of fun facts, you know. Yeah. It's great to read it over. You it's, know, on my lap, it's on my laptop in my office. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, there are some excited comments, like, can't wait to experience the same thing in five years as some did 50 years ago. That's right. We're the Artemis generation. We are the yeah, Artemis we generation. Apollo we years. missed Apollo, but yeah. we're, we learn from Apollo. Uh-huh. We're building on the shoulders of Apollo. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question. I think it's because we talk so much about the astronauts um, from It's Crazy K. What does it take to become an astronaut? 
Ooh, good question. And what did the astronauts have to do in order to land on the moon? Ed- education, <laughs> um, skill, determination, um, a little luck, right? Luck. The, I think the last astronaut class had something like... 18,000 applicants. 18, of which I am one. <laughs> I really? really chose about, yeah. Uh, I, you know, again? I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. I do. Yeah, someday. Um, but yeah, and our future astronauts for hu- sustained uh, humans in space, you know, we're going to need all different types, you know, engineers and scientists, but we're going to need people who can keep machines working, you know. We're going to need plumbers. We're going to yeah. need surveyors. We're going to need um, <laughs> folks who are can climb down, you know, canyon walls, spelunkers. Yeah, you know? right. we're gonna, all kinds. We're gonna need all types of, yeah. um, um, yes, all kinds of <coughs> specialties. Here's a related question. Maybe this should be our last for now, but mm-hmm. we'll get back to more of your questions later. But Latio sixty seven asks you, Kimberly, how long did you go to college to get the to get the knowledge for your current job? How well, did you get here? As I say, I stayed in school for a very long time. I did four years as an undergraduate. Um, got a physics degree. Physics is a great degree to learn how to solve problems. Mm-hmm. Then I did four years in grad school and I got a PhD in astrophysics. Um, and so, yeah, I stayed in school. And I remember um, when I got my first job, which was called a postdoc, is what you get after your doctorate, I went to another university, and my dad would call me up, are you still school? still in school? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm getting paid this time. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, so it was a, it was a good, um, good eight years of yeah. uh, schooling outside of high school. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, well I think worth it. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> and, and it's important to recognize, too, right, that we never stop never learning. Stop learning. No. Never right. stop True. learning. I mean, a job here working in the space business, mm-hmm. you're never, never stop learning. Yeah. Yeah. In a good yeah. way, obviously. Yeah. I, mean, I think by the time you're doing your PhD, you're doing something you're passionate about. Yeah. And so you're loving it, right? I, I yeah. do think that um, school, for at least for me, school got even more fun and exciting mm-hmm. the more years of it I had. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I think back to like my freshman year of college and it, it was a lot of work and yeah. it was really challenging and I mm-hmm. didn't know what I was doing. And as I spent more years in my academic career, it actually got easier and more fun. Mm-hmm. It didn't stop being challenging, yeah. but it, it became, it took on a different note. So if you're, if you're just starting in college, um, or if you're in high school or even in elementary school, you know, it, it does get, Easier, um, and I would argue it gets more fun as you as you go yeah. along. So don't be afraid of spending lots of years right. in school. Yeah. Right, don't be intimidated by. That's a good years. point. That's yeah. great. Excellent. All right, so we're going to get back to more questions later. And before we move on, I just want to let people know, I want to invite you to join us in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing and hear about our future plans to go to the moon and then on to Mars um, by tuning in to a special two-hour live NASA television broadcast. That's tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific. So to learn about the show and how to watch, you can go to www.nasa.gov slash Apollo 50th and click on events. Yes. Are you yes. going to watch, Tiffany? Oh, definitely. Excellent. I will be watching. I'm actually excited. This stuff is really, really cool. It it's really is. It's nice to, you know, go back in time and revisit history and see that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so let's dig a little bit deeper into the Apollo history and talk about um, all of those those cool cool facts that we don't know about, and you know, in order to do that, we have our historian here, James. Hi, Tiffany. How are Hi. you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so my name is James Anderson, and I'm the NASA Ames historian. I've been here for a couple months, right in all the excitement leading up to <laughs> good uh, timing. Yeah, yeah. Good timing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jumped right in, um, and the last few months have been uh, really wonderful. We've uh, had an opportunity to meet. Uh, a lot of Apollo era veterans uh, who worked at Ames and just getting to hear um, even more stories um, from that time um, many of which you know are are not the ones that uh, that you hear you know sort of all the time. They get told yeah. 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 So what what do you know about that time at Ames? It was uh, an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Um, The during the the whole Apollo program um, the the scope of the the number of people involved at its peak there were around 400,000 uh wow. Americans men and women mm-hmm. from diverse backgrounds working uh on uh, the Apollo project wow um and here at Ames there was also uh it was a time of building too a uh, number of new facilities uh came online and got funding uh, at that time um, and a lot of that research um directly influenced uh the design uh of Apollo Wow, that that 
it's amazing. 400,000 people right. you know, all coming together, you know, to, to solve this ambitious and really get this, yeah. this, this plan going and this project going to get to the moon. It's amazing. Yeah, it was an incredibly huge yeah, effort. Yeah, that's a lot of effort. Yeah. yeah. What are some yeah. of the facilities that they were building to support the new missions? Well, uh, funny you should ask. I've brought some historical artifacts with me. Ooh. Ooh. I like artifacts. <laughs> uh, some of those uh, from our uh, facilities here at Ames. Uh, Kimberly was showing a little bit earlier uh, the model of the Apollo Command Module. I've got another kind of model of the Apollo Command Module. Oh. So you've got this one cool. here. Is this guy Looks just doing? like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's got uh, it's got the exact same shape mm. of Apollo, and you notice one side is pointy and the other side not. Uh, why is that, Chad? <laughs> well, it's interesting. This is one of the unique contributions that Ames Research Center made to uh, not just the Apollo program, but to all of the the manned spaceflight programs of the time. Is um, Harvey Allen was one of the, the aerodynamicists um, here at the center. He was later one of the center's uh, directors. And he was studying um, how to protect these vehicles um, from heat as they came back into the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, previously, all the high-speed um, vehicles, they, they were very pointy, right? Sort of like the front end you know, had a sharp point because that was mm -hmm. the, the least amount of drag coming back into the atmosphere. Uh, but they got too hot. And Harvey Allen realized that if you went with this very blunt shape, um, it created a lot more drag and it would slow them down, but it allowed the heat to go out and around and it, the heat would not be transferred into the surface of the vehicle. So basically the, you know, the, the crew members in the vehicle um, would be protected from all that heat as the, as it came back into the atmosphere. Yeah. And of course, we're, we're doing basically the same the same concept today. So it's really a lasting contribution that he made. You can see that it's with anything. all the vehicles that are returning from the International Space Station, um, you know, and the commercial crew, mm -hmm. you know, the the Boeing and the, mm -hmm. the and the SpaceX capsules followed the same Just engineering, the changing, common design. the shape of something, yeah. right? Yeah. The design and engineering of something. But how yeah. would you have come up with that shape? Right. You had to do a well, lot of testing. Be, uh, yeah. uh, he was uh, an eccentric uh, character, and it really is sort of. Um, the best ideas come from the eccentric characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Get out of the box. It's, 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 it's a really, it's an odd idea that turned out to work really well. And that concept, the blunt body concept, um, was developed. It's older than NASA itself. NASA mm. was founded in 1958, but Alan came up with that idea here at Ames uh, in the 50s when it was still part of uh, the NACA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So Ames before it was NASA Ames. Yeah, yeah. Ames yeah. yeah exactly. Ames yeah. before it was okay. NASA Ames. And, and solving a problem that was going to be not, you know, was going to be used decades later. Oh, yeah. You know? That's yeah. incredible, too. A little forward thinking there. A lot of forward thinking. <laughs> Working but on the future. James, what do you do with that model? What uh, is, is it solid metal? It is. Uh, and you launch them. All right. And one of the facilities uh, that was built, uh, construction began in 1964 mm -hmm. on what's uh, known as the Hypervelocity Free Flight Facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, it formally opened in 1965. And uh, this model, and I've got another one here. Oh. Um, this facility, imagine a tube. Okay. 75 feet long, three and a half feet in diameter. And from one end, you've got a really high uh, speed stream of air at one end. And in the other, you've got a cannon. Hmm. Oh. A <laughs> cannon. So, <laughs> a cannon. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what do we do with this cannon? Well, you shoot it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, makes sense. And the projectiles. Yeah, and, the, and these uh, these projectiles, uh, they're they're made here in Ames's uh, machine shops, and this is another Apollo uh, model, uh, quite a bit smaller than the first one that we saw, but ah. actually this one, it would be loaded uh, into um, the the cannon at one end, and. Uh, launched upstream into that air so that it's traveling really, really fast. Wow. Yeah, we, through we, the we looked this up, and the, the facility has a top speed for that model yeah. of about 27,000 miles per hour. Whoa, for real. So it's wow. really moving. Wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. 
And it, it, it's really to reproduce the conditions um, of the capsule coming back into the Earth's atmosphere yeah. or, or the atmosphere of, a, of another world. Okay. And, and traveling from, say, a distance as the moon. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a unique problem for when you're sending something really far away and it's coming, coming back, back at mm -hmm. a much really faster fast. speed. Okay. Right. Right, right. right. We, we have an image, don't we, of what they would see yeah. taking high-speed photos of that, I think. Tell us what that's all about. So you're looking at a, um, an image of the shock wave that's coming off of that little tiny model as it goes down uh, down the tube. And in this image, the, the capsule's traveling from right to left, right? So um, as it comes into the atmosphere, this shock wave is created. And we talked earlier about how this blunt shape on the end of the capsule protects it from the heat. And here you can see it actually is making this layer. The shock wave is making a layer around the capsule that, that's protecting it from um, the heat generated by friction as it comes into the atmosphere. It's an it's a amazing. amazing photo to yeah. see. Uh, you can, you know, this was this was, you know, back in the you know pre-digital age, and so they had uh, you know, cameras set up down the tunnel um, to snap pictures as as the thing was flying down it. Amazing. That is amazing. We actually have a comment here from Quartz saying, amazing how far we have come in such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, you, think, you think about it, it really yeah. is. Yeah. You know, 50 years is not that long. Yeah. It's not that long and just, you know. Yeah. Old Morden says, awesome stream, NASA. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, thanks for watching. Um, I had another comment to share. I'm over the moon for the ah, new moon mission. No, we haven't heard that one before. So are we, calculate, so are we. <laughs> Excellent. All right. James, did you bring anything else for us? Uh, yeah, we've got another exciting artifact here. Ah, Kimberly's well, gonna... Kimberly has it. Okay. Oh, we can guess what this what is. What is that? Whoa, let me get out of the way here. Okay, James is bringing all unique. the cool That's... stuff. <laughs> It's encased in glass. What is that, James? Tell us what that is. That is a genuine moon rock. Wow. Uh, moon rock. This That's one an was moon rock. returned by Apollo 15 and uh, weighs uh, under a pound, mm. about 0 0.3 pounds. Um, and it's still like, I don't know, I, I get shivers every time I see it. It's, it's, it's so weird just to, to wrap your mind around. Uh, that rock's been a long way. Right? Uh, yeah. right. It's 3.4 right. billion years old. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, that's kind of the age of the first life crawling out of the ocean. Here on Earth, yeah. to current understanding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the moon is this treasure trove of science. The moon preserves the ancient history of the, of the solar system. And uh, even today, researchers apply to NASA all over the world to look at samples of the Apollo moon rocks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, wow. and it's still so rare. we're still uh, learning new new things. Wow, I love it, that in a way it kind of just looks like a rock because that just <laughs> reminds me that these objects and places in space are part of our solar system. Right. You know, just like Earth and well, one, one we're of all the things the that I'm noticing that I don't know comes across on the on the video. Right, is it kind of sparkles? It does. It yeah, it's got these yeah. 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 little bits of reflection. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and I, I, I'm looking at the monitor in the studio, and I, I'm not sure that that really comes across. It is it is not just this gray lump that it appears like. There's some really neat stuff going on that that just kind of brings it brings it. Well, I was going to say brings it to life, but that's not quite the right. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> not really. Far the right from term. that. <laughs> but at the time, back in the 1960s, um, we didn't know whether mm -hmm. life was on other worlds and it's still a quest that NASA and the humanity is looking for are we yeah. alone yeah. Yeah. yeah and when the Apollo samples were returned Ames was one of two NASA centers uh, that actually analyzed uh, the samples and looked for uh, whether or not uh, they actually had life well, yeah. or signs of life that's and, so cool yeah. I didn't and, know that and how did they how did they do it I think well, we actually have some footage of this we do yeah, yeah to help uh, us here explain. in our archives Tell yeah. Story, yeah. yeah, so um, from our archives here uh, at Ames, there's some uh, recently rediscovered footage. We're seeing it here now. Mm -hmm. um, what's going on here, Kimberly? What are we? Oh, so um, this is Apollo 11 soil samples that brought to the Ames Lunar Biological Laboratory. And they're being held in a sterile condition of these um, glove boxes in a clean room. And you see petri dishes. And what they're trying to do is see if life grows on the lunar samples. 
and um, they're mimicking conditions for which life has been known to grow on Earth, um, bacteria, microbes, and the like, mm. and um, and looking at it through a microscope. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a very dedicated, systematic study, and it f- laid the groundwork for the beginning of what we call astrobiology, at the time it was called exobiology, the study of the search for life, um, elsewhere in the universe and the study of the origin of life here. Wow. And um, the techniques here, you know, they, they learned that the, um, the, uh, the lunar sy- samples did not have life, but they didn't know it at the time until they'd done the experiments. Right, mm-hmm. right. You had to check, right? Yeah. It even still still laying the foundation for more science yeah. research. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the techniques, and the, not, you know, that techniques and other techniques looking for amino acids and mm-hmm. um, carbon compounds and you know, the, the stuff of the, life. The kind stuff of, of life yeah. led to the development of the uh, instruments that flew on Viking that went to Mars in 1976 to look oh. for life on Mars. And then, you know, uh, several packages that were also exploring life, you okay. know, on other places in our solar system because mm-hmm. our knowledge of the solar system today is way different. Mm-hmm. It's a much beautiful, more diverse solar system than. The scientists back in the 60s could have ever imagined because we've been sending all these robotic explorers over the last couple of decades out to Pluto, um, out through the giant planets, the moons of the giant planets. It is an amazing place to explore. We're still looking today. And we're still looking. And we have yet to find, you know, our life on this pale blue dot, our blue oasis world here is still one of a kind. Yeah. Still looking, though. Yeah. More to come, you know. (laughs) Always more to look forward to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Um, I have a few moon rock questions. Maybe we could take these as like rapid fire. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, what is the difference between moon rocks and earth rocks? And to go with that, are moon rocks more porous compared to the rocks on earth? Or are they just about the same? Anybody um, know? It's a, it's a range. So short answer, uh, the rocks on the moon are very similar to that on, on earth. So we have igneous that were made in a volcano. We have um, metamorphic that were made with high temperatures and high pressures. We have not quite sedimentary, which were made on the earth with wind and water. On the moon, they're called breccias. They're, they're shocked. So we have slightly different types. The moon, on average, is lighter in terms of its its rocks than the Earth. It's less dense. Oh. Um, this can lead to another discussion of how the Earth and Moon <laughs> form. So they're very similar, um, but they're slightly also different. But they're made of the same things. We're all made out of stardust, essentially, yeah. you know, yeah. at the end of the day. Nice, perfect. Um, history question for James before you have to go. Yeah. Uh, do the original mission control computers still work? Do you know? Um, the computers themselves, um, Images of them have been used uh, to recreate uh, the mission control oh, uh, yeah. room in uh, in Houston, oh. and uh, I would actually have to have to check, um, but I know that the the recreation that was done some of the some of the material in there is original, and other stuff was actually just uh, sourced on eBay. So the the coffee pots, the cigarette, you know, the, the, the ashtrays, all of that stuff to to really give um, the feel of what mission mm-hmm. control uh, was like during that time. And uh, the flight director Gene Kranz, when he went in just a few weeks ago and saw this installation. Uh, I think he made the comment it was something like he could hear the voices Mm. of all the controllers at their computer stations, at their monitors. Um, That recreation was so spot on that it just brought back um, this this, this really intense moment of, of a memory that, you know, um, how could you not forget? So they really got it right. Wow. Yeah. 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 Oh, beautiful. Excellent. (laughs) One last comment before the moon rock has to go away. Emergem, Emergem, not sure. Mm-hmm. Moon rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good. I comment. agree. I yeah. agree. <laughs> and more moon rocks are coming. Even though we're still That's have a lot. You're still studying right. the, uh, the. There's been samples that have been kept in. Um, have not been touched in 47, 50 years. Mm-hmm. That are being looked at. Researchers say because our yeah. laboratory equipment today is much more sophisticated and advanced. So mm-hmm. I'm thanking the scientists of the previous generation who left this gift to us today, so that yeah. we can continue our our search of knowledge. And when we get even different moon mocks from different places of the moon, yes. we will be able to answer some pretty tough questions that we haven't been able to answer. The moon rocks gave us a huge leap. 
and understanding. And we're still being studied today. That's awesome. Amazing. Like time capsule. Yeah. Right? Time capsule. Yeah. I think there are teams at Ames that are going to study those mm -hmm. samples, so we'll be able to provide an update yes. sometime yes. in the future. Yeah. Fun times. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, James, for joining Great. us. Thank you, folks. And Thanks, taking James. us down memory lane with the history. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> and we'll see you another time. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you all, don't forget to join us in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing and hear about our future plans to go forward to the moon and on to Mars by tuning in into a t to a special two-hour live NASA television broadcast tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Learn more about the show and how to watch by going to www.nasa.gov forward slash Apollo 40th, and don't forget to click on events. Apollo 50th, in fact, but... <laughs> ah, did I say 40th? Yes, yes. I meant 50th. <laughs> of course, of course. We're all mixed up. Just, just add 10, no, no, whatever yeah, says. Plus 10. <laughs> <laughs> plus 10, exactly. So, yeah, let's talk so. about our uh, next giant leap. Artemis. Yes, Artemis. So, what what is Artemis? Well, well, why do we call it Mar Artemis? So Ar Artemis was uh, Apollo's twin sister, mm. right? So it's if you know your Greek mythology, you know Greek mythology, mythology, mythology right? because if it's Latin mythology, it's Diana, but it's Greek mythology uh, is Artemis. Artemis. <laughs> yep. Kimberly with the fun facts. Hey, man. What you say? <laughs> I like the words. See, they're evocative. I mean, she's yeah. the goddess of the moon. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's very appropriate and. Yeah. Uh, and also with the Artemis charge, we're going to place the first woman on the moon. Yes. Uh, with the next crew to go to the moon. Yes. And um, an amazing leap for womankind. <laughs> yes. And I humankind. And Absolutely. It's, it's about time. Uh, <laughs> exactly. You know there are young women out there, students, young girls, who are like, watch out, moon. Yeah. We're coming for you. And since we're having our Artemis as a sustainable lunar exploration program, it is just different than Apollo. Apollo was like a road trip. I mean, it did amazing things. It was a road trip. Yeah, it was a road trip to the moon. No, it was, it was a huge engineering challenge just to even conceive going from suborbital flight to going to the moon and back in less than 10 years mm -hmm. and to build that whole infrastructure with a very elegant but complicated mm -hmm. logistical solution was immense. I mean, Artemis is different. We're do not doing it alone. It's no longer the realm of governments and superpowers. It's mm -hmm. a different era. Mm. Yeah. We have yeah. commercial and international partners, sustainable presence, um, and, you know, in the pursuit of knowledge, in the pursuit of innovation, with opportunities for economic and, you know, more spin-offs. You know, the Apollo yeah. program gave us a lot of spin-offs, what we call things that we use today as a result of the, the research the and the research and the engineering, engineering. technology mm -hmm. development that was well, done. And, and it's not just to go, right? The right. objective of Apollo was to go to mm -hmm. the moon and safely Come. return. Right. But, mm -hmm. but that was that was the objective. Right. right. With Artemis, it's to have a longer term sustained presence. Mm -hmm. And of course it's the path to Mars. Which is the next giant leap. And, to go to and Mars. So yeah. that it's fun, as Kim Burley said, it's fundamentally a different approach to than Apollo was. You know, okay, it's the same basic destination, but uh, we're not going to land directly on the moon. We're going to the gateway first, that'll be orbiting uh, an orbiting space station around the moon, and then going down to the surface from gateway, um, we're going to the South Pole, um, which is a, a very different place, in many respects more challenging than where Apollo was landing. Um, so there's many fascinating different things that are going into Artemis that um, were really never um, something that was even approachable mm. back in the Apollo era. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big big stretch from where we were at with Apollo. Uh, and of course, we have this longer objective then of taking what we learn mm -hmm. from the moon portion and taking that with us to Mars. Nice summary. Lots of challenges. <laughs> there, there are a bunch of questions that we'll get to about the goals and what's different. Mm -hmm. And I think you just gave a good overview yeah. to get us well, started. Of course, a, a, a huge part um, and really kind of the first and biggest step for Artemis, right, is how do you, how do you launch? How do you get there? Yeah. Right? We're talking yeah. about carrying a lot of material. We talked earlier about the Saturn V. Yes. Well, the, bi the, the big, big rocket rockets. for Artemis is the Space Launch System SLS. Ah, right? yes. And yes. SLS is, if you thought Saturn V was impressive, SLS is even more impressive. You can see some video of it here. Um, 
An so, animation. An animation. Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so the, the rockets and the, the engines are already being under a, a lot of tests right now. Right, and a lot of this is um, um, materials that we learned from doing the space shuttle missions. Um, so it's a little bit shorter than the Saturn V. It's 322 feet tall. Saturn V was 363 feet, so it's 41 feet shorter. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that's also a lot bigger than the space shuttle, which is the one we're used to flying, right? The shuttle was huge, and it's only 184 feet tall. Ah. So this is, as we said earlier, Saturn V is taller than the Statue of Liberty, and right, so is SLS, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost 20 it's a feet rocket. tall. It's going to be, okay. it's gonna be when, when we have it flying, it's going to be the biggest rocket ever yep. built. Wow. So and this capability even take payloads to Saturn and Jupiter. Yeah. I mean, this oh, is a wow. very capable machine. We, t we mm. talked about how much, um, how much thrust and how much payload the Saturn V had. Mm. And SLS is over a million pounds of thrust more powerful. Oh, wow. Right? So the SLS can deliver more cargo to the moon than the shuttle could take to low Earth orbit. Oh, wow. So that's, wow. that's just a, yeah. an enormous capability. Right? And as Kimberly noted, it take takes us to lots of other destinations in the future. Yeah, more so capability. So this is a huge capability. It's a unique capability. It's not something you need to put satellites into orbit, for mm -hmm. example. No, it's for right? something it's, more. Yeah. It's really for this unique, this very unique mission. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Um, you have a we have a comment here from King's Throne. When there are astronauts on the moon, I will stand and wave at the moon at a, at the full moon. I hope they wave back. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure they'll be waving back. Yeah, I'll join you. Unless with you Artemis, moon. if I get my wish, I want to land astronauts on the far side of the moon because we haven't been there yet. Ah. <laughs> In fact, Apollo only may have only gone to about four percent of the surface of the moon. There's a lot of Terra, sorry, Luna incognita. <laughs> yeah. To channel my Latin, um, that we the unknown territories on the moon that we yeah. haven't seen. We yeah. also have not yet been to the South Pole, right? right. Yeah, which is the Pole. first destination <laughs> for Artemis. Right. Mm -hmm. And to remind everyone what exactly we're counting down up here, <laughs> this is the time until 2024 when the Artemis mission will land people on at the, at the South Pole of the moon, right? There is a question. Someone was asking what's special about the Lunar yeah. South Pole. Could you tell us quickly what we might? Oh yeah, um, just in the last ten years, um, our understanding of the moon uh, flipped itself on the head, and we learned that there's water on the moon. I mean, of the uh. Apollo generation, they thought the moon was bone dry. Turns out there mm -hmm. is actually water moon. It's actually all over the moon. There's different sources, but the poles seem to have large quantities of water. Now we should we should know this is not liquid water, correct? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's frozen water yeah. and water in different. Uh, yeah, frozen and water. Crystals in the soil, crystals right? Crystals in the soil. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's scientifically interesting because um, it shouldn't have been there. And why is it there? We'd mm -hmm. like to know why it's there and Intriguing. where it is. <laughs> um, but as from a human exploration, it's uh, water is H2O. It can be used for hydrogen and oxygen for fuel, um, oxygen to, to breathe. Um, so the pole, going to the poles is a step in uh, human exploration using resources off the land. And the same techniques we'd use to harvest the moon water, mm. similar to what we do on Mars, because we know Mars has subsurface frozen water as well. Okay, so perfect yep. training ground. I mean, that, that's the big reason. To, that's the big reason to go right to the South Pole. South Pole is hard because you know um, it's it's in a lot more shadow, right? The sunlight mm -hmm. is a much lower angle, um, so you have to really think about how you build your mission much more carefully. Um, how do you generate electricity? How do you stay warm? Uh, yeah. There's a, a whole new set of challenges yeah. that we're, we really didn't have to worry too much about uh, in the Apollo missions. Uh, and, the artists, like and the Artemis and yeah. like hard stuff. <laughs> hard well, stuff. Easy. Yeah. Uh, we do things because not because they're easy, <laughs> because they're hard. Yes. And the Artemis program will have uh, humans on the moon for weeks at a time initially, and mm -hmm. culminating to months at a time. I mean, this is also different than Apollo. Mm -hmm. Apollo was, you know, Apollo 11 was two and a half hours on the surface, right. 21 hours yeah. just there on the surface, 22 and a half hours walking around. Um, we most went up to three days on the surface. So. Uh, this is a very different um, approach to being off-world for long periods of time, and how you do that from an engineering solution: your power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your fuel, your water, your air, your energy, all these um, the temperature, extreme you'll experience. Uh, they all can be overcome, and they can all be, and the solutions are going to be amazing. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You answered a question from Pi Day. What are some new difficulties with Artemis that were not present during the Apollo missions? Yeah, long yeah. duration, long yeah. duration, yeah. and that, that's maybe one of the biggest ones. Is we are sending humans out there for much longer periods of time, um, and they're beyond 
the the shielding from radiation that's afforded mm -hmm. by Earth's magnetosphere. So when astronauts mm -hmm. are on the International Space Station for long periods of time, right, up, up to a year as the record, um, that that's a challenging environment, but it doesn't uh, have the same degree of exposure to radiation that going out away from Earth has. And so that's I don't know, one of the big hurdles yeah, to so, overcome. So NASA is going to need a lot of uh, uh, doctors and mm -hmm. biologists and people who study the human physiology to work on mitigation and also to help with how humans, the fragilist point of long duration space, to, you know, space yeah. exploration, space exploration yeah. and mm -hmm. how the human body behaves mm -hmm. and reacts and recovers. Yeah. Yeah. From a, a that's very fascinating too. Right. So, but it's going to happen at Mars, too. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah. Um, this question from uh, Sleepy underscore Gary. Um, some of your answers already answered his question. Uh, what are the main scientific goals of the Artemis moon mission? And answering those questions are scientific and kind of also are things that we want to, you know, find out, right? Those are our goals. Yeah, scientifically, I mean, some of the biggest unanswered questions, even after processing the wonderful lunar samples from Apollo, um, we still... Um, don't really know what happened during the early phases of the early times of our solar system because um, the rock samples that we have um, might have uh, have a bias in it. They might not have been sampling some of the oldest places on the moon. So okay. looking for older rocks. Um, how the moon's interior looks like, we would like to have samples of the moon from the mantle, something below the crust. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that will take service, the going to different parts of the moon where we can actually get to the mantle. And perhaps we can understand how that moon formed and how it cooled. Um, and uh, the moon also um, p potentially could tell us what happened with our early sun. We're interested in oh. how the sun behaved during the early solar system, and this can help us understand extrasolar planet systems where we're looking at planets around other stars today. You know, there are more planets and stars out there. Mm -hmm. So our view of the Amazing. universe is changing, and we have our solar system in our backyard here. The moon has, um, uh, uh, has the answers to some of these questions. Awesome. The early phases there's of our a, There's also exciting. the basic science around, you know, human physiology, right? Which is, as we said, you know, how, how does the human body respond to radiation exposure, to, you know, long term deprivation of gravity, uh, all these things. Uh, I mean, those, those are really basic questions that are they're important for our eventual journey to Mars, but they're also, you know, the, the, just the basic knowledge that's often really helpful in unexpected ways for improving life on Earth. Mm -hmm. And as an okay. astrophysicist, I would be amiss if I didn't say I'm going to would love to put a telescope on the far side of the moon. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and it would open up a different range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we have not explored before because oh, wow. it shields from the radio emissions from the Earth. So oh. it becomes a new window into the universe just right oh, in our backyard because cool. the far side is, is, is facing away from us. And we could make it really big. Oh, really, really, really oh, big. Nice. <laughs> Maybe you'll get your telescope. I might get really, my telescope on the far side of the moon. <laughs> Nice. Uh, speaking of human bodies, <laughs> what kind of spacesuits should be used? Big and bulky, but safe, or small, tight, but flexible? Do you there's guys, a, there's do you guys actually know? been some really exciting work uh, done exactly in this area. Wow. Um, and th there's a, a number of different designs that are still being considered, but they kind of uh, hit both ends of that spectrum, right? Some, some of them look like the more traditional, a little bulkier suit, because it off offers a lot of protection from mm. the environment. Some of them are a little more streamlined and sleeker uh, because they're just easier to walk around in and do things um, and get stuff done, uh, and they just they just don't weigh as much. Uh, but I think the jury's still out as to which is the preferred one right now. There, mm -hmm. It's uh, an area of ongoing research and development. Yeah, there's a cool mm -hmm. idea of a particular design of one of the landers on the moon to deal with the lunar dust, which is a kind of a hazard. It's this glass-like because there's no wind oh. or water on the moon, flowing water to to smooth it out. Hmm. And one of them has you sort of, you're in your, your spacesuit and you go in and you leave your face spacesuit on the outside. Oh, you know, you kind okay. of decloak de 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 or something and then yeah. it's there for the dust doesn't get into your habitat. It never comes in. Oh, yeah. Neat. I there's, like that idea. There's basically a, an, there's a, a, lot of different creative there's basically ideas. There's a hatch so on the back of yeah. the spacesuit that docks oh, yeah. to the, the to docks. The, yeah, and, and so your <laughs> oh. suit always stays on the outside, where all so all the dirt, all the contaminants stay oh, cool. yeah. out there. So there's there's great. and there's a lot of work ahead. I mean, you're you're gonna when you're on the surface doing things, you're gonna learn. Oh, like the, like the Apollo astronauts learned, to, they're gonna skip and hop to get maneuvering with that bulky things. Mm. Um, the Artemis astronauts are going to find new things with their spacesuits and what things to change. Oh, I mm -hmm. can't drill as much. I can't climb. I can't, you know, rappel down the crater in as yeah. easiest way as I'd like, you know. Oh, yeah. So there's there's going to be a lot of different suit designs for the applications it mm -hmm. needs. And so we need those. 
we need those solutions and we need to while we we'll learn those as we explore more yeah, yeah. always learning always yeah. learning <laughs> always learning very good uh, do you have a question in mind i think i do um well we have one here for chad uh it's and it's about the sls so why uh why are we um, designing a new system to get to the moon and not just use the same Apollo equipment that we used last time. Yeah. Well, it's Actually, a good question. Do you um, maybe want to tell everybody the, what the full system consists of? We talked about SLS. Mm -hmm. right? Well, I mean, that, I think that's the the main one we're talking about. But there's also you know the equivalent to all the Apollo vehicles that Kimberly was showing with the little props, right? There's a there's a command module which now is the Orion. There's an equivalent to the service module which actually the Europeans are providing. Mm -hmm. There's a you know a lunar vehicle um, that uh, will be you know putting the humans down on the moon. Um, what's different this time from Apollo is we also have the Gateway, uh, which is an orbiting space station around the moon, um, and of course the big, the big rocket. So the question is, why don't we just use what we had in the Apollo era? Well, in principle, you, you could use those designs, right? But for one thing, we'd like to carry um, additional people, and the Apollo capsule is only big enough to carry three. We'd really like to carry four. Um, we have some video footage of the Orion well, capsule. Why, why don't we, we can yes. run that? Um, maybe I'll, I'll talk while we go, right? And you could you could see it's pretty good size. Um, one of the other reasons is that um, all those designs haven't been produced for fifty years, and so to go back and recover the design, recover the tooling, um, it's basically as big a job as making a new one. Hmm. Right? Yeah, there's, well, a, no. there's a story about how Elm Ames participated in a twenty first century detective story on the re-entry, the thermal, uh, the tiles on the bottom of the, the Apollo, thermal protection, the thermal system. protection mm -hmm. system of the, the Apollo capsules. They were mm -hmm. made of a, a chemical thing called Avcoat, and ah. they had to re-engineer the chemical formula. And a oh. 21st century version of that is on the oh, Orion okay. capsule. So yeah. we, we, thank the, we thank the Apollo engineers right. for providing that groundwork mm -hmm. and uh, we're using that. The research that we're so the, still mm -hmm. using. The mm -hmm. learning, the ideas, uh, if not the actual specific designs, are carried along Carry in on. the new program. And uh, you know, a lot of the elements of this program have actually been in development now for you know, more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we're not starting from scratch today. Uh, th this has been in development for some time. Uh, but a lot of the times, if, if you want to take literally the old design and reuse it, it can be just as much work as doing a clean sheet of paper. Mm. And doing the new design also allows you to bring you know, all our latest and greatest technology and ideas, um, which can make things lighter, uh, more cost effective, and in many cases, a lot safer. So we're always mm -hmm. looking at, at those things as we come up with new new pieces. I mean, even the um, Orion capsule that we were just looking at, it's essentially Apollo on steroids because it has an, an incredible amount of computing power that mm. oh, the yeah. Apollo capsule did not have. That makes sense. And it can yeah. carry a lot more payload, and it is uh, supports more astronauts for very long durations in space. It's a very mm -hmm. different um, mm -hmm. design. Yeah, as, as, similar, as similar as the Artemis program is to Apollo in that we're going to the moon, a lot of it ends right there because the, the basic requirements for what it has to do, for how long it has to go, for how many people it's going to carry are all different from Apollo, right, right. which leads you to you know, somewhat different solutions in the design. Makes sense. Makes sense. So we have the SLS rocket. We have mm -hmm. the Orion spacecraft. And then we have Gateway. Yeah. Should we talk a little more about Gateway? Gateway's going to be my next favorite species. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't I wait for Gateway. I, I think it is fascinating. <laughs> I, 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 it's, uh, it's designed in mind to be essentially our first interplanetary space tug. You know, it's a spaceship that could have, would have the capability of allowing us to maneuver things in space mm -hmm. and propelling um, other vehicles to Mars. Um, but it is a um, orbiting uh, ship around the moon. It gets as close to a thousand miles of the moon's surface, and it goes as far away as forty thousand miles. It's in this uh, rectilinear um, yeah. orbit. It allows you to land on any place on the on the moon. Wow! Which we didn't have with Apollo. Apollo, wow. the the orbit trajectory was you know on a specific place could only hand, land on the equator. This allows us to go to the poles, which we were talking about earlier. It allows us to go to the mm -hmm. far side. Um, but it has a very unique uh, propulsion on it. It's solar electric propulsion, and it's more powerful than anything of that type that we've seen before. And that's cool. the type of propulsion we're going to need 
when we're far from home, like on our journey to Mars. Right. Cool. And so that's going to be used. And I also love the fact that it's open architecture. Ah. All the ports are going to be made available online because we want uh, – it's going to have commercial and international partners docking, yeah, you know, coming and going yeah. and having humans on it and not having humans on it. It's going to be a uh, vacation home type thing. <laughs> you know, the astronauts will be there for a few weeks or a month at a time, and then, mm-hmm. then they'll be empty for some time. And um, it really is a way, a different approach to thinking about long-term human exploration in space. It's kind of like a space mm-hmm. condo. Yeah. Space oh, condo. Oh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're going. It's kind of an outpost, a staging place. Yeah. Uh, we hang out there hang for out. a while, and then then we leave. Yeah. And then you know, then we'll come back later, and we'll pick back up, and, and we'll do yeah. things. Mm-hmm. It's got this propulsion to be a tugboat. It also allows us to put um, biological ex- or other science experiments mm-hmm. on it. I'll put a telescope on it. Why not? Nah, yeah, yes. <laughs> throw it in there. Uh, control the rovers on the surface from it. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I awesome. think it's got a lot of potential. I think we actually Great. have an animation of Gateway to show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, there we yeah. go. This is showing all the different component modules uh, from both commercial and international partners, as well as NASA, being assembled to form, you know, eventually this this really functional uh, outpost in orbit around the moon. Um, and it also allows to have constant communication with Earth, which, again, is, you know, something you won't have when you go to Mars. But at least this time, mm-hmm. while we're working out all the interesting challenges of being away from planet Earth and being in this um, environment for long periods of time, um, it truly is a proving ground. And uh, it's, it's flexible in terms of what it can be used for. Awesome. Yeah. You guys answered a question from... Uh Oh gosh, I've lost it. Yoga Fire is Artemis a joint venture? The way that the International Space Station is international, and you talked about yeah, very, very yeah. much so. Partners, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and and more partners as well. I mean, International mm-hmm. Space Station is, has about fifteen partners. Wow. I mean, now we have eighty nine nations on this planet that have satellites in orbit. We oh, are wow. a very different species than we mm-hmm. were years yeah. ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as um, you know. Uh, the future of space is for the whole world, and we have a lot of nations. You know working in space in terms of their economics or their communication um, and they'll be partnering with you know this is what this um, the Artemis program is about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah Outstanding. Uh, we have a question here from an Easter egg uh, is gateway bigger than the ISS no no it's uh, I, ISS is really huge um, and and gateway because it's so much further away is going to be a, a much more compact uh, vehicle mm-hmm. um, you know, it'll it'll have a lot of the functionality that ISS does, just be you know, a little smaller, well, a lot smaller. Well, That's it's just cool. only to be occupied. Not so the ISS, an amazing achievement, has been continuously occupied for almost twenty years. Mm-hmm. November of two thousand was the the first occupants. That's and, crazy. Uh, People uh, in space, yeah. <laughs> and um, constantly you know, for it's designed years. for that reason. So, art, uh, so Gateway is going to be designed differently because mm-hmm. it has to be able to support humans for periods of time and then periods where it doesn't have humans. Okay, um, yeah. And so um, uh, that can be done because of our advancements in robotics mm-hmm. and autonomy mm-hmm. and smart software. I mean, I know it's a different vehicle, but you know we're starting to see self-driving cars, self-driving trucks. Our yeah. satellites are a lot more autonomous. We are a smarter species now, and uh, now space can take advantage of the knowledge that we've gained in that field. Wow. Well. Awesome. Yeah. I think we have time for like one more question. Yeah, and then we really one have more. to go. Well, the yeah, questions yeah. are the best. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this one from a random clown. What are some of the design challenges that have yet to be solved for this trip? Can you identify? Well, there's so many. I'm sure there are many. <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. I mean, if you just think about it, we were just talking about Apollo earlier in this, this show. When the charge came to go to the moon hmm. in 61, it was only 20 days after they had done a first suborbital flight. They hadn't even done an orbital flight. They hadn't figured out how to do rendezvous to spacecraft. That had been a lot of, they hadn't done a spacewalk. They didn't even have a space suit. They didn't have, um, they didn't have to do- We're in, a much yeah. better, we're in a much better place we're today. We're in a much better place. <laughs> but there, there will be challenges. There, no, no doubt about it. There'll be new, and that's the beauty of it. Because when you have a problem that has not been solved, that's when you get your creative hmm. new solutions. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. you're going to attack a problem and come back with something that no one's ever thought of before. Yeah. And then who knows where that's going to be? Oh. Lead us. Nicely said. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I guess we can. That's the perfect way to end this, huh? It is. <laughs> on that note, um, that's about all the time we have today, you guys. A huge thanks to our guests and everyone who joined us in the chat today on Twitch. Uh, we will be back on Thursday, July twenty fifth, talking about how to get an internship at NASA. That's how it starts. That's right. That's right. There are a lot of people here today who started yeah. as interns, right? Yeah. So that's our next show for this gang here. But remember to join us tomorrow in celebrating the Apollo 50th and hearing about more about our future plans to go to the moon and on to Mars. So tune in to our special two-hour live NASA television broadcast tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific. And you can learn more about the show and how to watch it by going to www.nasa.gov slash Apollo 50th and click on events. So check it out and we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Bye. Bye.